You know, this issue with the IRS is out of control. Um, for the record, the Dallas IRS office, yesterday it was revealed, is plastered with pro-Obama stickers all over their computers. Um, they have made statements to taxpayers uh, that they would like to have seen President Obama reelected in 2012, even though they knew they had no right to say something like that in public. Um, today, there's a hearing related to uh, Lois Lerner, and they're going to determine whether um, they're at this stage in the game, they're going to uh, file for her to be found guilty of um, contempt of Congress. When that occurs, and they believe that it will, then they're going to request that the Department of Justice immediately begin a legal prosecution of her for criminal activity. The problem, of course, lies with the fact that the Department of Justice is run by none other than Eric Holder. But to make matters worse, <laughs> turns out that it may well be that, uh, and, and yesterday this was revealed, that an email from uh, Representative Elijah Cummings and his staff was sent to and from the, uh, the, the IRS in which Cummings is actually involved in the, in, in the investigation of these conservative groups. And it's possible that the IRS and, and Lois Lerner's office distributed to him information that's privileged and not privy even to a congressman. I mean, remember that, you know, anyone's tax information is, is theoretically, allegedly protected. Now, the Internal Revenue sent tax documents to this targeted conservative group to, to uh, um, Elijah Cummings' office at his request, I might add. And here's where it gets worse, folks. He lied and told the, the panel that he'd never had any contact with the IRS related to this. You've got a senator who's actually lying to a committee he sits on. I mean, this is insane. I, I man, this is really, and, and, and of course, it, President Obama told Bill O'Reilly, there's not even a smidgen of corruption to the IRS claim. Newly released emails show, despite previous denials by ranking oversight Democrat Elijah Cummings, that such a contact actually has occurred. Emails released by the GOP-led Oversight Committee show that Democratic staff requested information from the IRS tax-exempt division on True the Vote. This is the one, uh, True the Vote, by the way, is uh, um, the, the one that uh, they were not only, did, not only were they harassed by the IRS, but they were audited multiple times. They had visits from the ATF and all kinds of stuff. Republicans and conservative activists say the IRS tax-exempt division, um, led by former official Lois Lerner, targeted dozens of conservative groups because of their politics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cummings became publicly, uh, in, or became interested in True the Vote and requested publicly, he requested some information from True the Vote in October of 2012 on its volunteer activities and training. Well, first of all, why would a sitting congressman request that kind of information from, that's the IRS's job, if anyone's job at all. But interestingly enough, five days later, the IRS sent True the Vote a letter requesting that the group provide the agencies with copies of its volunteer registration forms, the additional information on its volunteer activities, and amazingly enough, ladies and gentlemen, the questions were all the same. Cummings staff requested more information from the IRS about True the Vote. <clears throat> this occurred in January of 2013, a month, a year and a couple months ago. The request was sent on to the uh, Legislative Affairs Office, and from there, three days later, Lois Lerner herself wrote to her deputy, Holly Paz, and she said, did we find anything? 
and Paz wrote back that she hadn't heard back yet, and Lerner said, replied back, thanks, check tomorrow, please. In February of 2014, the Oversight Committee, uh, in, in a hearing, Cummings denied allegations by True the Vote attorney Cleta Mitchell that his staff had worked with the IRS in targeting the group. In other words, True the Vote's attorney said in an open hearing, hey, that guy right there, Cummings, he's been cooperating and working with the IRS to target my client. Cummings said, no way. Here's what, he actu- uh, here's what Mitchell said. And uh, again, uh, Mitchell is the attorney for, uh, for True the Vote. Quote, we want to get to the bottom of how these coincidences happened. And we're going to try to figure out whether any, if there was any staff of this committee that might have been involved in putting True the Vote on the radar screen of some of these federal agencies. We don't know that, but we do know, or we're going to do everything we can do to try to get to the bottom of how all this happened. Cummings turned around and said, what she just said is absolutely incorrect and not true. He staunchly argued back that he had nothing to do with it, that the Oversight Committee month-long investigation uh, and, and the IRS whole scandal was a waste of time and it was a waste of money and it was a witch hunt. That was his argument back. Well, guess what? Yesterday, Daryl Issa, the chairman, and the five subcommittee uh, and five subcommittee chairmen sent a letter to Cummings on Thursday that <coughs> they're demanding. Now, this is his fellow; these are his fellow uh, commissioners, right? That they're demanding an explanation for the activities of Cummings staff. Here's what I- Issa said in the letter. Although you have previously denied that your staff made inquiries to the IRS about conservation uh, organization True the Vote that may have led to additional agency, uh, I'm sorry, let me start that again. It's not conservation, it's conservative. Although you have previously denied that your staff made inquiries to the IRS about conservative organization True the Vote that may have led to additional agency scrutiny, communications records between your staff and IRS officials which you did not disclose to majority members or staff, indicates otherwise. As the committee is scheduled to consider a resolution holding Ms. Lerner, a participant, in responding to your communications that you failed to disclose to us in contempt of Congress, you have an obligation to fully explain your staff's undisclosed contacts with the IRS. Guess what? Cummings has no comment. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, has this become a banana republic? Is this what we can expect from our elected representatives? Partisanship on such a scale of corruption and intimidation and abuse, utilizing agencies like the Bureau of Land Management, like the EPA, like the IRS, as a weapon of mass destruction against the citizens of this country. This is insane. This is the kind of thing I would expect from some third world nation with a, a, a dictator who's living in splendor while his people are starving in the streets. I guess that's actually not too far off, is it? You see... It's not bad enough that the IRS is, and, and, it's, and it's very bad, but it's not bad enough that the IRS is being used as a weapon. Three times, Elijah Cummings himself sent letters to True the Vote, demanding the same information the IRS had requested. So clearly, they were colluding as to what questions to ask. And, and may, perhaps he figured if they, if they won't answer the IRS, I'll get the information. Folks, we have reached a point at which, for all intents and purposes, this government has ceased to be a nation 
that we can accept, a national government that we can accept. We can no longer accept it. You know, I found an article that was written by John Whitehead. I'm going to read it to you because it's worth it, and we got enough time for me to do this. John Whitehead is the uh, president of the Rutherford Institute, which is a conservative organization. There's no denying it. <coughs> and he's also the author of A Government of Wolves, The Emerging American Police State. Now, you know, you've heard me talk about these same topics repeatedly, and uh, but I thought his letter was actually so appropriate that I wanted to give it the time for you to hear it here. It starts out, the State Department wants $400,000 to purchase a fiberglass structure, sculpture, of a camel looking at a needle for its new embassy in Pakistan. They've already spent their allotted $630,000 to increase the number of likes and the fans on their Facebook and Twitter pages. <laughs> the NATO ambassador for the United States needs $700,000 for landscaping and gardening. The National Science Foundation would like $700,000 to put on a theatrical production about climate change. And the Senate staffers need $1.9 million for lifestyle coaching. Also, Yale University could really use 384000 so that they can study the odd corkscrew shape of a duck's penis. These are actual line items paid for by American taxpayers, whose tax dollars continue to be wasted on extravagant, unnecessary items that serve no greater purpose <coughs> excuse me, that serve no greater purpose than to fatten the wallets of corporations and feed political graft. Case in point, despite the fact that we have 46 million Americans living at or below the poverty line, 16 million children living in households without adequate access to food, and at least 900,000 veterans who rely on food stamps, enormous sums continue to be doled out for presidential vacations, 16 million for trips to Africa and Hawaii alone. Overtime fraud at the Department of Homeland Security, nearly 9 million in improper overtime claims. And that's just six of the DHS's many, many offices. And Hollywood movie productions, $10 million was spent by the Army National Guard on Superman movie tie-ins and advertising aimed at increasing awareness about the National Guard. $10 million. This doesn't even touch the astronomical amounts of money spent on dubious wars abroad. Consider that since 2001, Americans have spent $10.5 million every hour for numerous foreign military occupations, including Iraq and Afghanistan. Then there's the U.S. Supreme Court's recent decision in McCutcheon v. FEC which reinforces a government mindset in which the rights of the wealthy are affirmed by the courts, while the rights of average working-class Americans are routinely dismissed as secondary to corporate and governmental concerns. Under the guise of protecting free speech, a divided 5-4 to four court did away with established limits on the number of candidates an individual can support with campaign contributions. In doing so, the justices expanded on the court's landmark 2010 ruling in Citizens United versus FEC, which not only gave unfettered free speech rights to corporations, but paved the way for corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money promoting candidates, especially presidential candidates. What this does, of course, is turn the ballot box into an auction block, wherein those who are elected to public office are bought and paid for by those who can afford to support their campaigns, namely lobbyists, corporations, and high-dollar donors. When all is said and done, what we are witnessing is the emergence of a disconcerting government mindset that interprets the Constitution one way for corporations, government entities, and the wealthy, and uses a second measure altogether for average Americans. 
Unfortunately, as I point out in my book, A Government of Wolves, The Emerging American Police State, this constitutional double standard is coming to bear in all aspects of our lives, not just in the realm of campaign finance law. It allows lobbyists intimate access to our elected officials, while prohibiting Americans from even standing silently in protest near a government building. It grants immunity to police officers who shoot unarmed citizens while harshly punishing Americans who attempt to defend themselves, mistaking a SWAT team raid for a home invasion. And it gives government agents carte blanche access to Americans' communications and their activities, while allowing the government to operate in, in total secrecy with secret hearings, secret budgets, and secret agendas. This is a far cry from how a representative government is supposed to operate. Indeed, it has been a long time since we could claim to be the masters of our own lives. Rather, we are now the, su the subjects of a militarized corporate empire in which the vast majority of the citizenry work their hands to the bone for the benefit of a privileged few. Adding injury to the ongoing insult of having our tax dollars misused and our so-called representatives bought and paid for by the money to leet, the government then turns around and uses the money we earn with our blood, sweat, and tears to target, imprison, and entrap us in the form of militarized police, surveillance cameras, private prisons, license plate readers, drones, and cell phone tracking technology. All those nefarious deeds that you read about in the paper every day, those are your tax dollars at work. It's your money that allows for government agents to spy on your emails, your phone calls, your text messages, and your movements. It's your money that allows out-of-control police officers to burst into innocent people's homes or probe and strip search motorists on the side of the road. And it's your money that leads to innocent Americans across the country being prosecuted for innocuous activities such as raising chickens at home, growing vegetable gardens, and trying to live off the grid. So what are you going to do about it? <clears throat> Excuse me. There was a time in our history when our forebears said, enough is enough, and stopped paying their taxes to what they considered an illegitimate government. They stood their ground and refused to support a system that was slowly choking out any attempt at self-governance and which refused to be held accountable for its crimes against the people. Their resistance sowed the seeds for the revolution that would follow. Unfortunately, in the 200 plus years since we've established our own government, we've let bankers, turncoats, and number-crunching bureaucrats muddy the waters and pilfer the accounts to such an extent that we're back to where we started. Once again, we've got to decide whether we'll keep marching or break stride and make a turn toward freedom. If we don't have the right to decide what happens to our hard-earned dollars, then we don't have very many rights at all. If they can just take from you what they want, when they want, and then use it however they want, you can't claim to be anything more than a serf in a land they think of as theirs. This was the case in the colonial era, and it's the case once again. That was constitutional attorney John Whitehead. He's the founder and the president of the Rutherford Institute. And he's got that book out, A Government of Wolves, The Emerging American Police State. I've got to tell you, folks, I think he succinctly but accurately captured the essence and the spirit of where we are today. And I've said it many times. You've heard me say, the only way for us to end this is to begin to hold them accountable, to starve the beast. You, you have to realize that these folks cannot operate 
These agencies can't operate. The unconstitutionality, the abuse, the tyranny, the terrorism, government-sponsored, state-sponsored terrorism directed against us, it cannot continue if what? If we stop paying them. Now, I recognize that that's not an easy thing to do. When you work for an employer, the employer, you know, he, he pays the tax, right, on your behalf. You never actually see it. I get it. But it doesn't mean that there aren't ways that we can affect that, that we can't monkey wrench it. We can. For starters, you can go into your employer and refile the W-9 or the W-2 form so that immediately you're exempt from federal taxes. No money will be sent. Your paycheck will not have federal taxation taken out. Neither will your state. What are you supposed to do with that? Well, what I would suggest that you do with it is put it aside in a separate account. And hold on to it. Because at the end of the year, when you file your taxes, well, then of course you're going to have to come up with the money. But it does starve the government for the remainder of between now and next April. In fact, if you file an extension, you don't have to actually pay that money until sometime in October of the following year. We could have an 18-month window where we would, for all intents and purposes, freeze the cog, freeze the wheels, lock it down. We can sit here and watch as our property and our land and our government is stolen from us. Or we can take action to preserve that which we have and regain that which we have lost. You see, most people forget that we're seeing here an extended and long line of treasonous and unconstitutional, illegal, unethical, immoral behavior. Jefferson said to us that a single act of tyranny could be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day. But a series of oppressions, which have been begun at a distinguished period and pursued through every change of minister, too plainly proves a deliberate systematic plan of reducing us to slavery. Think about that for a moment. It's one thing when you have an, a, an elected representative, even a president, who makes a mistake. They make a bad judgment call. They make a bad foreign policy call. They make a bad policy call with regard to something domestically. And a single act of tyranny, even when all the evidence was stood there and, 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 the, and, the, and the person acted with impunity, knowing that, and, and all the empirical evidence surrounding that, that that was an act that was of tyranny, or, or even a mistake. And that can be ascribed to the accidental opinion of the day, his ideology. Maybe it was just a, you know... A series of oppressions begun at a distinguished period, pursued unalterably through each and every change of ministers, plainly proves a deliberate, systematic plan of reducing us to slavery. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what have you seen? What have you experienced? What have we collectively experienced in the last 25, 30 years? This is not the accidental history version. This is a series of oppressions. Clear, empirical evidence is, is, a, is available to anyone that is willing to open their eyes and look. It was all begun at a distinguished period. It has been pursued through every change of minister. And it plainly proves a deliberate, systematic plan to reduce us to slavery. This is not a partisan issue of Republican or Democrat. This is a condemnation and a damnation of both of them. And that's all it is. You've been listening to America's Voice now. 
please visit us at americasvoicenow.org. You can find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash America's Voice Now. And then you can find every program that we do at youtube.com slash America's Voice Now. You all have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Keep the faith. Pray for those folks out there at the ranch, at the Bundy Ranch. We'll keep you appraised of what's happening there. <laughs>